Be long, big no. You got it. There you go. <laughs> hey, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Pixel Feed Radio. And I'm here with Eric Pillow. <laughs> Did I say it right? That's what we were talking about yeah, when it kicked that's in. Good. That's good. Yeah, I think I said it right. So for those of you that don't know uh, Eric here, he's uh, he's the author of a book called uh, Surfing Rogue Waves. And uh, Surfing Rogue Waves is a book about the fourth industrial revolution that we're going through right now that I talk to you guys about all the time and my friends are sick of hearing about it. So I'm super <laughs> excited to have you here today because we're going to talk about that, uh, you know, how to take advantage of everything that's going on right now that's like literally passing right in front of me and some of you are just letting it go. Um, you know, it's like you mentioned in the book, it's like we're going to go through like a hundred years of, you know, uh, moving forward in a matter of nothing right, right? In, yeah. in a matter of yeah. a few years Wild. uh so it's important that everybody's paying attention to what's going on and uh, you're also the founder of project seven uh yeah. that's a project that deals uh with uh brain illness uh research and all that good stuff so we're getting into that too uh but before we get started man let's go back to uh to like high school college when you were a kid uh, were you always an entrepreneur, like, or did you have like normal, quote unquote, normal jobs, and then later on you decided to do your own thing? Yeah, a bit of both. I think most entrepreneurs also have to have the normal jobs to pay bills throughout that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, I have many, and I got so, fired from many. <laughs> that's right. Um, so yeah, definitely a bit of both. I mean, grew up, you know, playing sports and and you know, exploring, you know, lakes and and all that kind of stuff in in southern Ontario, kind of just south of Toronto where I grew up and. I did a bit of both. I started as an engineer and I, I worked like that for a bit. And then I actually, you know, left the kind of corporate nine to five engineering job, which seems crazy to many. And, uh, you know, the first kind of endeavor, we actually created uh, an energy drink gum out of energy drink ingredients. So, it, you know, it gave you all the energy of a normal gum, but, you know, it came in a little cool chewing gum can and kind of had that idea with a friend and, you know, snowballed into more and eventually left an engineering job and, did, you know, did that for a couple of years and gotten, you know, the Walgreens and all that stuff. And it was a real fun, um, you know, fun, fun learning experience for me. And then I oh, wanted hold to come. So you, hold on. Sorry. You, yeah, you yeah. actually managed to get into Walgreens with the uh, energy drink? Oh yeah. Yeah. Walgreens, uh, you know, CVS, the circle K's, all that stuff. So it was like, it was, it was actually a gum. It chewed like a gum and tastes like a gum, but we made it out of the uh, energy drink ingredients. So, you know, okay. all the benefits, you know, none of the how, I'm curious, how did you get, how did you manage to get into the, the, those retailers Did you just email calling, call calling? How did that happen? Yeah, that was my, uh, you know, hard knocks, um, way of, I guess, getting into the front end of the business. Cause I, I was an engineer and, you know, we had this great idea and we, we made it out of pharmaceutical pill presses and we started to get some, you know, traction and, you know, we, we threw some feelers out there and did some cold calls and, you know, got some responses and all of a sudden we, you know, we need to kind of take that, you know, you got, you got to take that pill and either, you know, go to go all in on it and go to conferences and try to sell this or, you know, continue this, this great engineering job you worked yeah. hard to get into. And, uh, you know, thankfully, I had really supportive parents, you know, I, I'm sure they, you know, they asked all those questions, like, so let me get this right, you know, you're leaving your engineering job. And do you know anything <laughs> about selling into convenience stores? Do you know any, you know, do you know anything about selling at all? Um, and, you know, they kind of agreed that, like, you know, at the time, they're like, hey, look, you're in your 20s, if there's any time to kind of like roll the dice and move back in home, you know, go for it. Uh, That's so, really cool. Yeah, it was just that. It was honestly, it was just relentless. You know, it was a little bit different back then, obviously, um, you know, in the early kind of mid 2000s. But th that's what it was. It was just kind of relentless uh, stalking and getting creative and using online. And back then it wasn't what it is now. Right. Back then, people didn't really understand what Facebook even was. And I'm sitting here going in and like stalking and learning everything about these buyers and how to get a hold of them. <laughs> right. And everything yeah. pretty much outside of their corporate email. And I ironically ran into them, you know, in their favorite coffee stores or, you know, trade shows and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and obviously that game's changed a lot now, but yeah. So, and, and it just kind of snowballed, you know, how it works once you finally get into one, then the other competitor wants it. And we, we kind of got some great traction. Um, that's so funny you know. that you, that you mentioned the whole Facebook thing, because, uh, when, uh, when I was single and this is before privacy controls and all that stuff, uh, People that, I mean, you can still do this, but people have control over it now and they know right. how to control it. But I, every time before I went out on the date or, you know, if I saw like a girl in the group that I dig and I wanted to like have an excuse to talk to, 
I will pull up the Facebook account and just go through the likes. I'm like, what is she into? Boom, boom, right. boom, boom, and just break down the whole personality just like a like an ad campaign. <laughs> and I, I call it to this day the creeper method because you can still do that. Like yeah. I tell people, like, go in the ads themselves. So when you see somebody that says, I bought mine or I love mine or I purchased it the other day, right. look at their profile, look what they're into, look at their likes, and then that helps you build your customer avatar. And then, you know, Facebook threw in the privacy controls for yeah. uh, good reasons. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you can't do that. You can, but you can't. It's like, it's not all the information like you used to get. Yeah. And to your point, like, you know, it's, it's that slippery road, right? Like those are good, harmless ways of, of finding things, but you can also can imagine. Oh, yeah, all absolutely. Ways, no. sure. and, and, and to your point, like, you know, your digital footprint and body language now is, you know, is so much more right now. People, you know, have the Twitters and the Instagrams right. and, and some private and don't, but and you know, this is neat when it's you and me talking, but when we get into, and we'll unpack some of this later, but when we get into some of these technologies, I mean, they've got all the data and they're pulling oh, yeah. trends, you know, we don't even see or know. Uh, it can be used for really, really bad things. So, right. you know, keep yeah. it private. I mean, I'm all for privacy. Uh, even though yeah. Apple has screwed everything up in the past few months, but I'm right. sure we'll get through it. <laughs> uh, we'll survive, right? Okay, yeah. so you, you managed to get into Walgreens, CVS, all those uh, retail, big box retailers, which is awesome. So... What happened after that? Yeah, so we do that, and then we notice this trend in the industry that uh, you know the Cokes and the Pepsis they're buying, and now it's going to make sense. But you know, in two thousand and seven, it didn't. They're buying these like random, like uh, so vitamin water and Glasso just got bought by Coke, and that was kind of the trend. And energy drinks were still the thing, and they were, but the, the trend was they were all buying these. It was coconut water at the time, and mm -hmm. sure, it makes sense now. But in 2007, if you told me about coconut water, it's, it just sounds disgusting. Um, right. and I like it. I, I hydrate on coconut water now. But so it was. It, there was this big shift, to, uh, a bit more less like how much caffeine can you pump in your body, and I guess more like a health holistic shift. And so we met with some of the in the Mars and Wrigley's, and you know we had a couple million in sales, and you know, you know, punk twenty something year old kids, and it's it, it was just wasn't enough market share to kind of get bought, right? I mean, the the Coke, the Pepsis, or the Mars and Wrigley's of the world, they have $50 million marketing campaigns for single products. You know, mm -hmm. we just didn't have enough of that, you know, Red Bull-like market share. Uh, so it, it kind of fizzled away a bit, and it was a good opportunity for me to get back into more on the technical side. I did have, you know, technical background, and I, I kind of consulted and more on the front end on how we kind of commercialize and, and take products to market, like technical products. And it was, a, it was a neat timing where there was some pro audio companies I was working with, and this was like the Beats by Dre kind of phase was just, you know, going yeah. off, and that was the new thing. And 50 Cent at the time just came out with new headphones. So, so I got to do... Um, a bit more of that and they you know I, I was consulting at first and they kind of flipped me you know full time which isn't i guess all that uncommon and then from there i moved uh you know i i actually went and did an mba because i noticed like to move into like a lot of these larger organizations you've kind of got to understand at least the language they talk in right so so i went and did that very much in information systems and technology and and that led me to like I finished it and kind of had more questions than I did when I started because, you know, it was one of these, like you're, you, you come up with this great idea and then they're like, cool, but just do this to finish the degree. And you're like, well, what's the point of all this? Um, so that left right. me kind of, you know, in limbo and cause I was never really wouldn't have been, wouldn't have called myself an academic at all growing up. And, and then I uh, moved more and more to the front end and, and, you know, working with clients and it kind of led me down this path of, we're, we're, we never notice this change until after it happens, right? Suddenly we're, we're talking to each other through Zooms. We've got voice recognition systems that we've connected our entire house to. No, you know, none of us ever voted for this yet. You know, Google and Amazon, here they are. Um, and there's a lot of these trends that I, I kept trying to think, why don't we notice this, this disruption happening a lot of times till after, right? The obvious ones looking back, Blockbuster, Netflix, great. Yeah, it makes lots of sense. But like, how do we kind of notice that those trends going forward? And one of my profs pushed me to, to look into, um, you know, a, a dissertation, a PhD. And I thought, well, I'm not, you know, you know, going back to being a full-time student, you know, at the time I, you know, had a, a girlfriend that I wasn't quite married to yet, but, you know, didn't want to, you know, rely her on, on, on putting me through this and taking all the bills and everything. So um, I ended up finding a, a professor who, who, who kind of I could work with and I didn't do like a lot of the TA hours and I still did kind of more of the consulting stuff on my own and was able to keep working with clients and kind of move the, my research and my dissertation through and, and really more on how we 
pragmatically identify change as it's happening, right? So we've got these exponential technologies and trajectories. So we understand general exponential trajectories, right? And and, and from there, we, we, we understand, you know, how this disruption kind of works and where it emerges. Now, we don't understand the sequential steps and we can't tell you exactly what will happen when, but we notice the general shifts. And that's more of like the surfing rogue waves, right? We don't know where the rogue wave will emerge, but we know they're coming. So it helps to be a good surfer because that way, you know, we can read and react <laughs> yeah. to what's coming. Uh, right. So I built it all around that and I built this theoretical framework. And when you do your dissertation, it's it's very, very, you know, myopic and small and specific. I did it on executives and global organizations and, you know, and consulting firms, but it, it applies to so much more than that. And that, that was kind of uh, what I built it on. And then I, I kind of just repackaged all of this. And then spent another couple of years kind of updating more real world kind of research and disruption and really, really digging into this, this fourth industrial revolution that we're, we're right in the middle of right now. I mean, when we call it out, there's changes all over the place. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. And, and, you know, it's, it's equally as much, uh, you know, for people in business as it is, we're finding more and more of your, you know, you as the CEO of your everyday life, because the worlds are blending, you know, we used to have kind of work in life and now they're, they're, they're one and the same a lot of times. Um, so yeah, it's always been the same for me. <laughs> so I was so young, but that's different. No, I get what you're saying, especially now with, um, you know, after the the quote unquote pandemic, I guess we're still in it. Right. Uh, you know, people working from home and, you know, people that were used to going in an office their whole lives and all of a sudden they're working from home. It's so new to them. Right. Uh, and I mean, it's a big change for everyone. I mean, listen, I, I'm a super extrovert and I'm used to working from home and the pandemic still hit me hard. Right. So I can't even imagine if you're an extrovert who actually enjoys going to the office and now you're stuck at home working on top of it. Like I, I, I can't even, it's hard. It's not easy. Yeah. Introverts dream, but extroverts nightmare. <laughs> right. You know? And there's all those kind of right to your point, those social and cultural elements. But I think that's a great example, like the pandemic. So, you know, in industry, companies have been, you know, trying this digital transformation and they weren't ready to pull the trigger. And then suddenly this this rogue wave came, you know, in the form of COVID-19 and it kind of forced them to do it. And companies, for the most part, have adapted fairly well, you know, to kind of moving back home, you know, lifestyle, productivity is kind of figuring its way out a little bit. But in another example where they weren't preparing and they weren't doing digital transformation, unfortunately, is education, yeah. right, for younger children. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we weren't ready for it. We weren't ready for the waves and you know unfortunately it hasn't been a great success right it's hard to take you know myself never mind an eight-year-old or a ten-year-old and ask them to sit in front of a computer for eight hours a day and to your point those children need different development right than you and me right they need the social interaction and playing with other kids Absolutely. in recess and so those are two great examples of where one industry was kind of ready for something and they didn't know when it would hit and it did and they adapted fairly well could have been better and the other industry you know childhood academics just it had a lot of trouble right we've got yeah you know, we kind of have to get the kids back in school is is the is the takeaway and that's kind of what um you know there, there there's ways we can see and identify these and i think we're very big into predicting right okay well you know christian tell me exactly when that's going to happen well we don't know exactly when could be one year could be five years but if we know it's coming we should prepare for some of these things and sure. you know it's it's crazy how we're not for a lot of them it's it's wild it is. It really is. Um, as far as like um, the the we have to what you just talked uh, spoke about like school. That's a really good point. I have a pandemic baby, so he was born like literally right before it started. So you know, it was a worry of mine, and it's like because there's no social interaction with other kids, even though he's tiny, you know. And the doctor's like, no, it's fine. It's like when you get to like you know three or four, that then you really have to have that that interaction, right. like that social interaction, and what makes a difference. But I, yeah, I can't even imagine with like multiple kids and all of a sudden. I mean, one of my partners in one of my business, she she's a mom of two, and <laughs> just trying to get in, do our meetings throughout the day, which is very informal between her and I. You know, it was just right. like the kids are running in the background, so it's a big, big change. But imagine if this would have happened you know, without all the technology that we have now, like, could you imagine, you know, what would happen right. to like a lot of these businesses? I know like e-commerce, for example, which I deal with daily, it advanced, I think it was like five years in less than six months, just because everybody right. just like, oh my God, we have to go online. It's like, yeah, we've been telling you this for years now. Right. <laughs> See, yeah. this is why. 
Uh, not because of a pandemic, but this is where everything's been heading for a long time. Like I always joke around like, man, if I was the CEO of Toys R Us, that company would have never gone under because I would have started selling real estate like it was going out of style and moving everything online years ago. Crazy, you know, right? and that's that's part of it, which I, I don't understand how that happens. I mean, the only explanation that I have for that is like some dude that's like 80 at the top calling all the shots and he just doesn't get it. And everybody right. else at the bottom trying to tell him, like, hey, man, you got to go online, right? <laughs> well, that's, yeah. that's an example of it. That is a perfect one, you know, and I think what the hard part with disruption in general is, you know, when our, 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 our industries are being run by, you know, quarterly revenue reports, they need to make money that quarter. And again, that CEO is paid really for that year or two, not, yeah. not to look five years into the road. And, and that's the hardest part because, you know, you have to disrupt yourself. If you're not constantly disrupting yourself, you're, you're, you're kind of dying, you know, like change is just happening. You know, you, you said it at the start and you're exactly right. I think the numbers they're showing now is we're experiencing like an in industry, we're experiencing a hundred years of change almost every year now. So, you know, if we look back and we're like, oh, you know, that, that took 200 years to happen. I mean, to your point, COVID-19, we're seeing like disruptors of disruption. e is a new concept. And we saw that fast forward five years in, in a six month window. Like yeah. this is change that, you know, to your point, we're not always seeing and, and there, there's very clear signals and we're not even getting into, you know, the fun stuff, right? With these exponential technologies and, and these other mega trends of the fourth industrial revolution, there's this this crazy byproduct of, you know, in our lives and business of, of what we call, I guess, disruption. And I think like when we're, we're talking about forecasts in like robotics, virtual and augmented reality, right? Nano and biotechnology, material sciences, sensors, right? All these individual things are now colliding with 3d printing and blockchain and, and these global digital networks and we're layering artificial intelligence on top of it and this is this is an explosion in the past it used to be one thing right an advancement in neuroscience was great for neuroscience right well now that that advances you know convoluted neural networks in ai development and and they're 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 not independent anymore like they used to be and that's what we're starting to see kind of collide and amplify each other and that's where we're going to, you know, the waves of disruption, you know, and thing and things like science, you know, whether you believe in it or not, there if we don't address it or face it and ride it, you're going to be left behind. Like the fourth industrials, you know, here. It's 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 coming and that's that's a bit of the it, but the book is not a technical or academic read, it just puts it a bit more in like, you know, everyday kind of perspectives for us. Right. So let me ask you something because I don't know the exact I couldn't give you like the exact date. I just seen it, you know, go faster and faster and faster every year with technology. So when, when do you think, or it was like the four, when did it officially start the fourth revolution? Like what year would you say we started moving this? Yeah. Fast? And I, and I think like all disruption and change, right. There's, you know, there's no like opening day party and suddenly right. you know, it, it's, we kind of wake up and we're in the fourth. We had the, you know, machine production and, um, you know, in the first industrial revolution. And this right. kind of led to creation of steam engines, which, which led to locomotives that build these distribution networks, right? Supplies and food. And then we had this, you know, and that was really, you know, in Europe. And then we had the second industrial revolution, which, you know, came eventually the Americas. And this became the age of science and mass production. And, you know, we started to understand infectious diseases, right? And, and, and diseases themselves. And then we had this, this third one kind of appeared and, you know, not hundreds of years ago, but more like in the nineties is the, the innovations of this third industrial revolution, right? That brought us these semiconductors and mainframe computers, which led to personal computers and smartphones and the internet. And somewhere in there in the last kind of handful of years, we're now in the fourth industrial revolution. I want right? to say the last 10 have been the most insane because I'm 40. Okay. Right? And I'm just like, well, while we're talking about this, I'm thinking, okay, like my whole life. All right. So if we go back to when I was born, Okay, and I'm thinking what I've experienced personally that I can remember, like, wow, it blew my mind, was definitely Atari when I was a kid. I had an Atari when I was a kid, right? That was the early 80s. Then we had an Apple II when they first came out. I was a lucky kid that my dad had one. So I got to experience it. Yeah, I mean, it was such a big deal. I mean, it was like, wow, this is amazing. So we got, and then I witnessed computers go from Apple II to like 286, 386, 486, Pentium 75, Pentium 115, 133, 144. Like it just went boom, 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 boom. And then in the middle of that, you had, you know, 
you kind of had the cell phone in the late eighties. At least my dad had one in the late eighties too. Right. And then early nineties, like beepers. Then we went to like Pagers, Nokia's. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we went to Nokia's and then, it, but in the middle of it, you have Nintendo, Sega, super Nintendo and TVs are getting better. And I mean, and then the iPhone came out and that was a game changer. You know, right. that, that, that blew everybody away. And then after that, it was just like, everything went by so fast, right? Like computers, chips, microprocessors. I mean, just in the past 10 years, if you really think about the past 10 years, you know, Facebook wasn't a big deal 10 years ago. I no. mean, at all. I mean, it was there. I was lucky that I was one of the first few that right. got a hold of the advertising, but it, it had already been around for years before that. I just... Yeah. It was just college. No many people right. knew about it. And yeah. then you have Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Snapchat, TikTok. And, you know, our phones keep getting more powerful and powerful. VR, you know, I remember they tried VR in the 90s and we were blown away by that. And now right. it's like an Oculus is like, please. Yeah. You know, and uh, obviously it's just a matter of time before zuck lord you know, releases the metaverse like he keeps talking about I've been working on for years. It's like Rogue Player One. You know, like yep. the movie where you're going to hang your NFTs in your living room in your virtual mansion. That's I right. mean, you're already doing it in games. Kids are already buying, you know, skin for the games and items, digital items and all that stuff. It's just crazy. And that's the disruption that you see, right? And even when you're talking about the iPhone, it was all these other advancements. Like, it, you know, it wasn't just a phone getting better. It wasn't the Ericsson getting better. There was a right. step change when we got screen resolutions and plasma TVs and we, we all these different industries and all of a sudden networks were there. And at the time, I think it was 3G, unfortunately. And we've come a long way from that, right? But yeah. we had 3G now. What 3G to download a movie, you know, used to take, I'm going to get the numbers, so don't quote me exactly, but sure. it used to take days, right? And then we had 4G, which would take five minutes and 5G is less time than you just blinked right there would download the same movie that a 3D, you know, right. 3G used to be. And like, <laughs> yeah, Napster, LimeWire. I mean, it's yeah. just like, it, you know, I've, it's so much of it that I can't name all of them because it was so monumental and, growing up, you know, having all this stuff and and I mean, what's crazy is that the, the, the disruption doesn't come like the old days where like, you know, Blockbuster would lose, you know, um, you know, or Kodak would lose to like another camera player. Kodak lost to the iPhone. Yeah. And, and Kodak's business model wasn't just printing pictures. It was, you know, the cameras, it was the ink, it was the paper, it was all these supply the chains film, along the way. The film. Right. And when you get these exponentials in place and they, they kick off, suddenly when you go through kind of these, these, these digitized, once you digitize these offerings, there's this deceptive phase, which no one notices. Then it's disruption. Then it's demonetization. Now all of a sudden everyone can have as many pictures as they want on their phone. And soon enough, the phones are taking better quality pictures than a lot of these cameras. And, you know, Nokia is sitting there, you know, out of business now they're bankrupt. They didn't lose to other traditional competitors. They lost to entirely new market disruption. And we're seeing that right kind of all over the place. And, and we're seeing it in sad examples, that, but, but good and hopeful examples. There are more people with access to mobile phones in the world than toilets are running water and toilets are running water are linear. I have to yeah. build a different toilet each time when you digitize some of these offerings, right? You know, and it doesn't always have to be like a pure turning it into ones and zeros. We've got Peloton. That's a 200 year old invention, a stationary bike. Well, you know, you can only put, you know, if you go to a gym, you can only put 40 people in a spin class. Well, Peloton has 20,000 person spin classes. So they've just digitized the experience, put the bike in your house, give you all the benefits of it. And hardcore fans. <laughs> yeah. And my wife they and build, her friends, they, they have that hardcore. It's crazy. They're, they're, they're like total groupies for it. Yeah, like I'm sitting here one day and this thing shows up. I was like, "You, you, you paid how much for that?" I'm I like, know. "It's a bike. It's a freaking right. bike." She's like, "No, you don't understand. All my friends, we'll do it together." I'm like, "All right, whatever." You and, know. And and <laughs> what's crazy is like, who are they disrupting? They're disrupting gyms. They're not yeah. disrupting other, you know, other spin bike people really. Like, and that that's the crazy shifts that we can, you know, if if we use this, I call it a surfing framework, right? But this little lens and model, it really kind of shows us that because. Yeah. Like you mentioned, we've we've entered the fourth industrial revolution. I I think it's the most exciting time in human history, right? Where we're going to solve and achieve kind of impossible, like seemingly impossible things. Uh, but you know, with more risk, also comes more reward, right? It's going to be my yeah. My friends, uh, all of my friends, they're very very successful, but they're all the traditional. I mean, I say the ones that I grew up with. They're all traditional doctors, lawyers, financial right. advisors. So they're in that 
and those world and they don't keep up with this like I do. And when I go out with them or talk to them and I'm like, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. You guys got to keep an eye on this. You guys got to, you know, you know, pay attention here, pay attention. And they're so lost. They're so lost. Yeah. They don't even know what's like, they don't, 90, they don't even know 90% of it. And I forget how, how I take it for, not for granted, but like it's, I'm so used to it by now that, 90% of people don't even know what's going on. Like going back, yeah. I mean, it's like you said, it's, it's even the iPhone. I've never been an Apple fanboy at all yeah. uh, because I build my own PCs, but I still remember watching the keynote because it was such a big deal. And when Steve Jobs is facing around, he goes, it's, uh, what, what is it? Uh, your iPod, your phone, and your camera. You're getting it now? And then he shows up. I mean, everybody went nuts, man. I yeah. mean- I got one as soon as it came out, you know, I had to. Uh, and it's just one of those things that just changed the world. I mean, then you got, you know, uh, Elon with, uh, you know, the, uh, what is it? Well, SpaceX, obviously, but. Um, oh, and he's the Tesla and he's, he's you know, he's, he's what, What's the, the satellite, the internet with the satellites? What's the name of it? I forgot. Starlink. Yeah. You got Starlink, which, you know, that's all data. I mean, it's, right. it's crazy. Uh, I mean, and then he has a uh, Neuralink. I was going to say that he's, that he's putting chips in pigs' brains right now. And, yeah. you know, it's, uh, <laughs> well, and that's how it happens. And again, like, obviously, if I'm like, hey, in the future, we're going to like be able to augment our happiness by, you know, exciting little neurons and that are, you know, that are going to fire in our brains, which cause chemical reaction. You know, we get the dopamine and we're happy. And, you know, if I stuck wires in your head to do that, you'd be like, that's gross. But like, when was the last time we used wires? We don't use wires much, right? Like I'm yeah. not wired into the internet right now. So right. by the time this hits, it'll probably be wireless. And, you know, much like IVF, uh, 50 or 100 years ago would be a mind-blowing, impossible concept. I mean, that's an everyday thing. And no one kind of noticed. It's just like it's here now. That That's an, you know, you were talking about our lifetime. That's like an our lifetime thing. Like our, our parents, our parents never, that was not even an idea when they were little. Yeah, and I was telling my wife, I was like, listen. Here it is. My will, if the technology is there, I want my brain downloaded. I want right. I want backups. I want I don't want to die. Uh, I want to stay here for as long as I can. Uh, yeah. I mean, and, it, it's crazy. Forms of that kind of stuff is coming, right? And and again, a lot of it is the uh I think what's crazy in this is this this uh you know full on hyper mode of like complex disruption we're going through, you know, this all these changes, even you know, even in traditional companies where they you know you can ignore it but it's 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 coming right you know this the world's less predictable it's 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 more relentless there's it seems like there's you know catastrophic things happening and we should be you know we should be concerned but this is you know also transforming everything in our world and and when and when i yeah i don't know when i look at all these kind of collisions they're not just happening in any any one industry right like we're in the coming years we're going to reshape everything what that means is this this exponential disruption is 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 going to obliterate present day i don't know you name it transportation finance real estate education advertising to food health manufacturing enter, you know entertainment kind of and of all these industries and for the most part you know we're not really kind of preparing or talking for these changes all that much right you know we just kind yeah. of you know, I don't know, I guess, I guess hope they show up. And again, we don't maybe not know exactly where they are. And I think when we get into these discussions, people either think they're very um, technical academic. And at the end of the day, I mean, here we are, right? Most people, they have to, you know, buy milk and get to work on time and pay for bills and make sure they have enough internet to watch, you know, Netflix. But so this isn't always like a, the future is not always like top of priority, right? Because a lot right. of us are, 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 a lot of people are trying to make it in in today but that's kind of how like the, the book just shows you how we kind of always have to kind of be looking just ahead right for where that next wave is coming because you know what to your point how do the 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 ethics around that work right what what you and me might be okay with right you know might not be and there might be technological and you know systematic challenges that some people are okay with and some people aren't and how are we going to kind of rethink and reconsider how we raise children right or how we govern cities and nations or how we care for the planet and you know what does it mean to be human if we're augmenting humans and how do the moral and ethics work around there and you know whatever the answer is the one thing we're not doing enough i feel like is talking about these concepts and that that that's literally you know that the, the takeaway from the book and, and it means it's different if you're a healthcare taker or not because you're gonna have very different views of the world but it's not a technical one a lot of these debates Right. I think it's uh it's also a lot of people think that they go to school and once they're done with school, it's like, okay, I'm done with education. Like, you know, I just go to work. 
Like, right. listen, I'm very successful in it, but I'm a college dropout, man. I dropped yeah. out. What it was, the second year, second or third year, sophomore year. I can't even remember now. But um, I read. I read so many books, and it's like that's one thing I keep up with technology, and you know, listen to podcasts that are about you know technology and stuff that's how i know what's going on you know what i mean it's not right. like somebody sends me an email it's like hey this is well i do get those too but you know what i'm saying it's <laughs> not like you know you go outside say like, hey christian here's the new technologies for today you should be looking into it. it's like a lot of it is right. just you know i got into bitcoin super early just because i knew about it you know because i was into tech right. so but i think and it's a lot easier to find all this stuff all it takes is a google search man just google it's like what's going on right now what's disrupting x industry and you'll see everything about it i mean you know and back in 2010 11 it was a little bit harder to find all that information but now there's no excuse so uh what do you think uh from all the research that you've that you've done as of right now as of today what let's say what are the top we don't have to do five but i'm just saying top five in case you have five industries that are, that are being disrupted right now that you see in the next five years being like upside down with crazy stuff like um, in, in, in terms of like advancement you know or that's going to disrupt a bunch of stuff yeah so and i, I take a i take a stab at this in, in the book which is fun the epilogues the end and i i i throw it out there and i don't know if i'm going to be right or wrong but these are things that could sure. happen and what's this cool is what is, you think this is what yeah. you think yeah and you know what I'm also thinking I could rewrite the book every two years because I could be wrong depending on what the breakthrough yeah, is. Yeah, there you right? go. But, yeah, um, sure. But when you look at some of these, uh, you know, advancements in, in again, material sciences and understanding more and more of the nano and biotech, and all of a sudden, you know, we can have you know wet matter and liquid forms that we could print. I mean, if if there's a sudden need where we can print things on demand, so they did this. The space center, a couple of years ago, the, the you know one of them broke their finger. And they didn't send a splint to space that would take, you know, I don't know how long and it's a fortune per pound. And they just sent literally a digital thing where they had a 3D printer there and they printed, they printed themselves a splint, and put the splint on their finger. Like, awesome. so, so when you think about that, if, you know, I feel when we have these conversations, people are either like way too down to earth or way too out there. Right. So yes, theoretically, if we understand the molecular atomic level makeup of food, we could send 3d printers and solve world hunger and print food. Right. Cool. We, you know, if we understand nanotechnology, we can repurpose garbage into food that, that that's far out there for me still. But the more we start to, you know, the same way your phone sitting in your pocket right now would have been a hundred million dollars, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Like that's in your pocket now. Once we start to get 3D printing in industries where they can print stuff and we're putting entire buildings up right now, all 3D printing, yeah. like what happens to the entire logistics and supply chains of transportation, right? That, that That's a very auto one. I think finance is another one. And, and to your point, like you're a lifelong learner and I think everyone needs to be now because the change is so much, but like you don't, there used to be like these little monopolies. Well, look at finance now, you know, everyone's angry about the retail traders of like the, the power is moving back to the individual people. Right. It's I love these, it. These, yeah. <laughs> right. It's great. Yeah. I mean the, the app, the, the one's called Robin hood for a reason. That's exactly what yeah. it's supposed to do. Right. And or real estate's another great example where, you know, you, you, you know, there's a couple of great cool companies out there, but like you, you can go and sit somewhere now and walk through a house. Like you can actually walk through the house in, in, in the VR and AR experience. And I mean, yeah, like, I actually, you, I actually feel bad for real estate agents because I don't think they know what's coming uh, it, soon, very soon. And in, in terms of like, you know, I'm going to be able to buy a house literally with a click of a button and there's not going to be a need for like, let's go look at a million houses. And, right. you know, and, and I'm not saying that because I don't like real estate agents or anything like that. I have friends who are very successful really. And I've been telling them like, dude, I'm like, this is what's coming. What you do with information is up to you. But you know, Gen Z and the one after and the one after that's not how we, how they think, man. That's, it's just not, you think they're right. going to go into a car dealership and sit there, sit there for eight hours negotiating a car. Right. No, no, bro. They're going right. to be like Tesla, like here, click, yeah. done. Where's my car? Right. And I think what's scary is like a lot of these new ones is, is everything as a service, whether it's housing or cars, you know, there's less and less people even owning cars. And, and I think, you know, to your point, like there is going to be kind of two types of, you know, real you know, cars. you know the what the end goal of Tesla is, right? Like yeah. The, actual, the, the end goal. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, because a lot, when I read this, it was build the cars for as cheap as they can, uh, you know, or, we are where we're at right now, but to build a car as cheap as they, they can, they can sell it for. So the ultimate goal is while you sit at home, the Tesla will go out and do Uber for you basically. Yeah. So it's going to make you money while making Tesla money. That's yeah. the ultimate goal for Tesla. 
Yeah, that that was his. Uh, and I mean, it's wild, right? He released that even a couple of years ago when we were like, what's this guy talking about? And that's exactly what he said. He says, you're going to go to work or you're going to go home and you put your Tesla online and suddenly your Tesla goes and autonomously drives and makes money for you. And it's a win win. If you can afford a Tesla, great. You have a Tesla. If you can't afford a Tesla, your Uber rides two bucks now. You yeah. don't care because your Uber, you know, your car's out there making money instead of sitting in your garage. And yet it's, it, this is, that's another one of like an everybody wins one, right? Kind of thing. And so there's like endless amounts in education. There's this great uh, Peter Diamandis he has this X prize foundation and, and they put challenges. There's like two or 300 million, you know, underprivileged kids around the world who don't have access to education. And what they did is they made this contest and the winning company had this app and the app has like, it, 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 cognitive computing. So what it's doing, it's tracking your eye motion. It's keeping you engaged. So anytime, if the, the more I keep you engaged, the more you want to learn and listen. So imagine we went to school and it was like, we loved it because it was so fun, like a video game. We would have learned way more, right? We, we went into these rigorous academic systems that haven't changed in a hundred years. Like how, how pathetic is that? In our yeah, family? school failed me. I mean, if you go back to my school years, you know, even college, the, the college that I did, all the classes that I excelled at, it was stuff that I loved doing. Like right. all the other stuff, I'm like, you know, either did horrible or like I failed. And it's just like, why do I need, you're an engineer. So of course you need calculus and stuff like that. I get it. Right. And, and you want to have general knowledge. So you want to put me all the way through algebra too. Great. That's like exercising my brain. It's good yeah. for me. But, you know, at some point it's like, all right, guys, like, I don't think I'm going to use algebra two for, or, you know, calculus to do e-commerce. You know what I mean? Like, right. it, it's I, just, I also just think it's changed so much. When was the last time any engineer ever multiplied, you know, or did longhand division? You know, right. We're not, we're not, well, I, I get mean, what they teach it is to exercise your brain. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. I get that. And that's but, the part, but if there's fun, more, you know, more engaging, fun ways to do that, we're going to get more people doing it. So sure. what, what, the, what, the, what the program found was that in one hour of engagement playing through this app, the, the children in the sample tested against like an eight hour day here in like, you know, North America. And it was the same amount of learning that they were pulling. Wow. So what, what, what's wild is it's a quick fix. I mean, Android is putting out a billion phones a year, which means... We're buying new ones and throwing out our old ones. Well, now every time you discard your phone, if it gets wiped clean and has this new program on it, we send it to any other parts of the world and suddenly we have an extra 300 million kids being educated, which is all adding to innovation, which is adding to more ideas and more opportunity. And it's just, you know, speeding everything up. You know what I mean? Like, I think, I think uh, you know, health is an obvious one where if you get real-time tracking, you know what I mean? All the time, then the doctors aren't checking up on healthy people. They're dealing with sick people and your data your, your physiological data and biological data will will let you know way ahead of time, you know, if you're doing well or not. I mean, if you look at food and what we're doing now and we've got this ecological crisis, well, you know, once you get into, and, and again, it's not as far away as a lot of us think, right? A lot of this stem cell based. So a stem cell based meat, for example, is when I actually take a, I, I take a biopsy from a live cow, let's say, right? And, and then I put it in here and I actually use science, it, it, strangely enough, in a tray, let's call it, to rebuild that piece of steak. It is it is not something that tastes like steak, right? It's, it's not made out of soy. It is literally cellularly the exact same as steak. Right now, it's expensive to do that, but we've learned through the exponentials, right? One of the further steps after disruption is demonetization. So when that becomes cheaper now, we can you know, we can feed more people with less pollution right now. We've got grazing cows on whatever it is, like a quarter of the world's livable land mass. You know, we, we don't need all that kind of pain and suffering when we can build up steaks at a cellular level or hamburgers at a cellular rid level. Of, uh, factory farming, you know, it's like, yeah, all the, the pain and suffering part of it as well. You know, vertical farming is another one now where you can do these in cities and high rises. They use, I'm going to get the numbers wrong, right? But like a one and one hundredth of the water because they spray the nutrients right onto the cells. There's no dirt and they can produce, you know, X amounts. And when you pull something out, you know, from miles away, it loses like up to 25% of its value. You know, every couple of days it's on the road, like, if every city we were in had these kind of vertical farms, you'd be eating everything that's like literally come out of the ground a day old. And again, I'm not talking about like fake carrots or, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm literally growing a carrot the same way. I'm just right. not doing it the inefficient way. And right. this is happening right now all over the place. And it's just, you know, I don't think we notice it because it's maybe not on our menu every day, but it's creeping into some menus, you know? Um, and I'm not like, 
the Beyond Meats and those ones are different as well, right? Because they're actually like, you know, plant-based meats. But these things I'm talking about are like indifferentiable at the cellular level. Like it, it's yeah. wild. They're just expensive right now. But like, you know, we're not all seeing this happening. I mean, that's this- a joke around, man. We're going to be able to clone ourselves and download our brain. Like, right. what body do you want? Well, I thought about this. I actually want to go to 30 because you're not too young. You're not too old. And if you speak, right. people take you seriously. So well, and then what I say all the time, it's wild. <laughs> and, and when you add some of these other advancements and then you throw little scientific advancements like CRISPR, which at, at a scientific level is actually pretty easy to do gene editing, right? You can gene edit out sickle cell out of, yeah. out of children. You know, at some point that might be, it might be illegal not to do that, but we have this. That one, that one, I like the fact that you can get rid of disease before it happens. But what I'm, what I don't like about that one is that slippery you slope. know people are going to take advantage. Like I want my kid to be seven, five, you know, yep. 300 pounds basketball player. Like that's yep. the one with like, you know, at that point, let nature do its thing because now you're altering humanity as a whole, which like, what are we going to have? Like, you know, eight foot showers in hotel rooms. You know what I mean? I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that one. So, so I'm with you. And, but the book is, that's what it's about. Like, I'm not for or against any of these. We just yeah. need to be talking about them because like, that is kind of exactly how it works. And you might not be for it, but if we don't talk about it, it's about keeping up with the Joneses. And if your kid can never, you know what I mean? Be a good athlete, be, you know, never, That's well, point. then you kind of have to do it. And, and yeah. all of a sudden we're going to be here because like you said, we have this inability from, you know, fixing humans to upgrading them. It's, it's yeah. always a slippery slope, right? We invented plastic surgery to put soldiers back together. Plastic surgery industry is a booming industry, not because it puts soldiers back together, right? right. It, it's because we have, you know, breasts and butt and faces and noses mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff. Well, in South Florida, trust me, I know. <laughs> yeah, right. um, so, so to your point, like, yes, maybe it starts with like, it would be inhumane to, you know, risk sickle cell. So we should remove that. But then who draws the line on, is it blonde hair, blue eyes, or, you know, you know what I mean? And then it, it's, yeah. it's these little things. And all of a sudden, you know, if we're not talking about these things, we wait. There's up always in this a black world. market too. You know, right. there's going to be a black market for everything. So, and that's the next one of like, if we're not proactive globally with these initiatives, it's not like the old days. We can't just do what we want over here on this side of the pond and Europe do their own thing and China do their own thing and Russia do their own thing. Cause if we're like, Hey guys, we shouldn't, we shouldn't do gene editing. That's wrong. But China does and Russia does. Let me tell you how that works out for us over here. If 10, 15 years from now, they're all smarter. They're all faster. The Olympics are boring to watch because they slaughter us at everything. Like, you, you know, it's, it's, it's a, what we're not good at is, and you mentioned it earlier, like this COVID global pandemic, we all did different things. Yeah. The, these, these mega trends, these technologies, these are things we are going to have to come together kind of globally on. And that's not been one of our strengths, right? Like our, our, right. The, the, the collective minds of humanity. humanity. Yeah. Um, and that's a lot of, of, of kind of what the, the book unpacks. And they're, they're things that are, are literally happening right now. And, and, you know, we're chasing in the first industrial revolution, we solve problems, right? Like war and, you know, that, that was a big problem, right? And hunger and, you know, violence. And, and this, this don't take this the wrong way because those things are all very much real, right? But they're not existential problems anymore. They're not going to kill off humanity, right? Um, still need to work on them. You know, if we wanted, we could probably even solve some of them if we came together, you know what I mean, globally as a yeah. world and prioritize some of them. But the future things we're chasing now are, you know, aging, you know, how does that work, right? Like we're kind of always maybe one step ahead. And, you know, once we can, you know, replace and 3D print organs and these things, you know, do we live longer? And what does that mean if we're living, you know, I don't don't think we're going to double the human population overnight. But what are we doing if people are living to 130? and 140 yeah. and you know when do they retire how does that what is that you know or to your point are we like you you naturally do this and not everyone does and one's not better than the other but like what about the people who aren't entrepreneurial they don't want to reinvent themselves right they they, they want that consistency well how do we kind of re-educate them and keep them up with the time See, i thrive like, for that shit. i thrive yeah, for it. I'm yeah, like, right, bring I'm it man what are we going into now <laughs> But um, yeah, not everybody's like that. My wife is like, you know, my wife, she, you know, she has a professional career and she went to school for it and she loves her structure and that's it. You know what I mean? And right. there's me with all my crazy ideas. So, but you're yeah. right. I never even thought about that. Like if you start living to like 200 years old, like you gotta, I'm going to have to reinvent a few times over. 
Uh, because yes, a lot of jobs are going to go away, but there, you know, there will be new ones made with technology advancing at right. the same time. And, and none of those are are technical debates, or they're active. You know what I mean? These are like ethical. Like, where do we stand on it? Like, you know, we should have more of the like. You know what? I don't. I don't. I don't know if I'm okay with gene editing newborn, or yeah. you know what I mean? Or like, how do we draw a line on it? Or you know, and and if we take one view and other places take other views, it just doesn't work that way, right? Like a lot of the way that these little, you know, a lot of the machine learning has gone to these, we, we touched on it quickly, these convoluted kind of neural networks and they learn on data, right? And here, you know, in North America, you can opt out or protect yourself, right? You know, in Europe, it's the opposite. You have to opt in to give your data. So it's, a, it's a, even tighter there. But then there's countries like China, where th no one has any rights to their data. Yeah, the no government choice. has it all. So if, if if you're using a machine that literally needs the most amount of data to more accurately learn, that is a disadvantage. China is is advantaged in that case. And, you know, that's great. But like there are conversations that aren't even about that. Even if we did that here, if we took an AI and we dumped in all of our, you know, data into it and all of our history, Right, it would pump something out that would say, "Well, actually, you know, Christian, you're wrong. You should work in a leadership role, and your wife should stay at home and work in the kitchen." Because those biases are built into our past. They're built into our histories, our movies. Our now we've learned, and we know that going forward. But if you only learn off our past, right, we're not having these 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 conversations on on how we build out a lot of this stuff and the way a lot of this AI works. And we're hearing it is it's a black box, right? The weights move so so often to get to what you know they think is the right answer that the developer is unable to actually understand fully what happened. And it's where does accountability lie, right? Where right. does it lie if that Tesla goes out and it hits in, it hits, it hits a child? I mean, is it the network that went down? Is it the sensor that failed? Is it the car owner? Do you sue AT&T and Sprint or do you sue Tesla? Like, I'm not, you know, I'm not for or against any of it. I'm just saying like, these are discussions we're not really thinking through, right? Right now we want to be in control. And when we're in control, we know who to blame. That's Listen. great. But like, the, the government do, can't even keep up with Facebook, Google, and Twitter. So, right. I mean, like, it's I not know. very promising looking forward, you know, so. So, and I, and I agree. And what I think more than ever, though, is, you know, we can help drive that. And when I say we, I just mean all of us, right? Like, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing great movements that are probably long overdue. But, like, there, there's a lot more individual power to individual people because you know and when you understand complexity sciences you can never exactly predict it but you can shape it and nudge it in the right direction right so if we have right. more and more at least people having these discussions if we want to leave it up to our politicians i mean come on we're screwed right i mean let, <laughs> yeah like yeah we have no chance um you know and the organizations are organizations so Part of me is like, I, I probably trust the organizations more, but I don't want to leave my future, the future of humanity up to quarterly revenue reports because that's the reality of, right? That's right. the reality of a company. They they, they, they yep. become big and they have to report. So we all know the ethical boundaries they'll push um, right. when, when needed. So it's, it's, it's just, it's a, it's kind of a big conversation that I think we either shy away, don't talk where, just don't think about. But, you know, the first step is really like, we should just be, talking more because I think you and me are probably more like-minded, but when like my wife read my book and again, she's the same, right? She went to chiropractor. She works the chiropractor. She's the organized one. She's all over it. I'm all over the place. Um, <laughs> you know, but her lens when she reads it is, is so different than mine. Right. And that, that's cool. And, and she dug into different things that I touch on, but like happiness, right? Like we have way more than we ever had, despite what we read in the media and all like, you know, the, the, the misinformation that's out there like the world's like safer than it's ever been i mean everything's great but we're not any happier suicide rates are actually higher than they were and there's cool case studies like uh um south korea where they were very impoverished and they had this great rise you know and in 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 25 or 30 years to like being a strong powerhouse nation and the happiness levels are arguably you know the same or worse 1950s to now if you sample the same people which we did over you know over here in north america they're the same right you, you see these campaigns i want things to go back to the way they were you know whether it's in the uk or in right here in the us and that's people feeling like things were better in the past than they were now and you know what are we doing all this for if we're not even any happier right yeah. um so they're just there's there's large philosophical bigger debates and conversations that everyone can be taking part in we did spend hundreds of years already talking right kant came out and said 
people have infinite worth and things have finite worth. And well, can't, what do we do now when people and things are blending together? Because over all the previous industrial revolutions, we were the constant, everything around us changed. Now, everything you're talking about, you're all in for, that's you changing, right? Augmenting human intelligence, downloading your mind. And now, now we're moving into these things where we don't have this black and white, finite worth, infinite worth, we're blending them together. And who draws the lines, right, on, on that stuff? Um, and, you know, it's either going to appear in our, you know, archaic, you know, rigid, slow moving governments will do it or companies will unless, you know, we kind of step in, I guess, people and, and and start having more of those conversations. Right. That is so accurate. It's ridiculous. Like, I've never met anybody that thinks like I do when it comes to all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so I, we're running out of time, actually. So let me ask you something for those for those that are that are listening right now. Uh, so they don't sit there 10 years from now and be like, oh man, I missed it. What was I <laughs> thinking? So how do you keep up with all this stuff? Like, what do you recommend people to pay attention to, uh, in order to, if they want to find an opportunity to take advantage of everything that's going on right now, how, what should they do? I mean, what should they do in terms of keeping their eye, eyes open? What's their best bet to try to keep up with, keep up with all of it? Yeah, um, I'm going to give a two-part answer. The first is going to be a, a, a shameless self-promotion, but um, if you read the book, uh, it kind of <laughs> gives you this this great framework, and it really puts it in kind of everyday terms. Right. Um, and then from there, I think what you'll see, and it's it's not uh, you enjoy it, but not everyone enjoys right reading up and following Elon Musk and seeing what you know you know, these, these new Google divisions that they're spinning out to do their AI on, and bef right? And, and before Elon, don't, okay, if you keep up with Elon, you guys got to remember, he's been working on whatever he talks about now, he's already been working on it for like oh, yeah. three years at least. Right. Like even Jeff Bezos said on himself, my job is to work on what's five years in the future. That's why he's flying to space. Like right. it's not just because it's fun. Like he's been working on that for years way ahead of time. So yeah. those guys are not, I mean, it's good to keep an eye on that. That's my opinion, by the way. Yeah. To keep an eye on that. But the real stuff you really got to dig in for. But please continue. What you're saying. Yeah, I, I think you got to dig in for it. And I think, you know, a lot of it just it go, we, we, we don't think about it, right? So when, when we know how to look for these things, when we kind of understand how complexity develops and how, you know, we can improvise in our decisions and actions in our, in our everyday life, you know, we can choose to spend a bit more time and understand that. But in, in the book, the final part touched on this a little bit, but like, if we're not rational about all these things and rationality is a very different kind of thing, but it defines how our decisions and outcome actually map back to the reality of the world. So I can think what I want, but if it's not right in the world, you know what I mean? I can say, uh, you know what, Christian, you're entitled to your own opinion about gravity. I don't believe in it. Well, I'm still going to die if I jump off the mountain. It doesn't matter, you know. Right. And we see so much of this in the misinformation. I think the biggest thing that we need to try to do is, you know, look looking at ourselves and in, in the first three industrial revolutions, power was access to information, right? In this fourth industrial revolution, power is understanding what information to ignore. You know, we're, we're bombarded and overloaded. I love that line. Yeah, with information, right? And that is, that is what the book kind of helps you to do, but it's, it's more just a lens that always has you questioning what you're doing when you're looking into the four, because there's so much there. And a lot of times, honestly, uh, you know, things will be connected. So if I say, you know, we're a thousand meters up and um, that means we're gonna fall this fast and I need to throw my parachute, you know what I mean, after after seven seconds. But if we're not actually a thousand meters up, cause I just thought we were a thousand meters up, I'm still gonna pull my parachute too late and die. So even though some of the things can be connected, are we looking kind of that layer deeper, right? And we've had a lot of trouble. Um, you know, COVID-19 is a great example. Like this is the way science works is when new information comes to, we update our models or if our model's wrong, we throw it out. And, and models like, you know, general relativity that Einstein came up with in the early 1900s, we've been trying to debunk that forever. And you know what? We haven't done it yet. So we feel stronger in that. But, you know, we watch this pandemic unfold in real, real time, right? Where science is not talking to us like, like we're all not all scientists here. And you know, it looks like they're changing their mind. And obviously if you change your mind, you don't know what you're doing. And actually science prides itself on changing its mind. New information comes, we either update the model or we throw it out. And I think if we can take a bit more of that mindset where we get very stuck in our ways, right? And especially, and I, and that, and I don't get into the politics of it, but politics is a great example. We're seeing these ex in, in all countries and it's highlighted here, obviously in the US, but you yeah. know, a, a, across the world, you're seeing it everywhere. You cheer 
you're, you're, you're cheering for politics like your sports team. You're not being rational. You just, you want the other guy to lose no matter what. And that's, that's not right either. Like we should have tons of overlap. Yeah, that's stupid. I, I said all the time, yeah. like stupid. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, we, we need to be okay with rechallenging things we thought we always knew and, and updating our models, right. To try to keep up with this kind of constant change. Cause that way we're at least nudging along with it. Otherwise, yeah. You know, we're fighting too hard to sharpshoot, you know, to your point, like Uber's biggest investment was in flying cars. I wouldn't go throw all your money into flying cars right now. I mean, at some point we'll probably have flying cars. Right. Could be three years, could be 10 years. Who knows? Um, so it's it's more of that of just being okay with constantly and not 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 taking it personally like, oh, I was wrong, but more like, okay, cool. I have more information now. How do I update that? And challenging that information you're getting, not to have it reinforce your bias because that's our natural instinct. We all do it, right? You, me, everyone. Yep. We, we, we take the information we want it to support what we already thought it was. Yes. But like how many of us really stop? And, and as the, the most successful race on the planet, the human race, we have higher order thinking, which allows our brains to actually think about thinking. So like that, that's what differentiates us. We're not stronger, faster than, you know, lions and bears, but we are definitely dominant over them. And that's because we can step back and use higher order thinking to kind of challenge what we think should happen, right? Or everything you see with your eyes, well, you don't believe everything you see with your eyes. And we understand a lot of things that aren't direct anticipation, right? I'm looking at you and I, I believe I'm on a podcast. Now, I also know that there's, you know, atoms, you know, holding up my desk. That's, I don't see the atoms holding up my desk, but they are in fact there. But understanding atoms helps understand how the world's going to work. So a lot of these things that, you know, you know, I don't see with my own eyes doesn't mean they're not happening, but then we have to do that deeper dive on understanding why they are. So I think it's really, uh, it's on us. You know what I mean? I think it's easy to pass the buck and say, um, you know, other technologies, but I think we got to look in at our own kind of mental architecture because we know by it, we know we have biases and we know where our shortcomings yeah. are and being human, we can actually recorrect for that, which is the much, much harder, you know, effort. Um, so that's a long, long answer to a passionate topic, <laughs> a passionate topic for me. <laughs> no, it's good, man. We listen. We can talk about this all day long, and that's I right. love, I love uh, uh, interviews like this because it goes by so fast. Like it's that's been right. over an hour. Like you, I would never Crazy. guess so. Anyway, Eric, where can everybody find the book? Yeah, so the book is uh, Barnes and Nobles, Walmart. Uh, yeah, a target, uh, you know, the Indigo chapters, it's, it's on Amazon, of course, um, as well. And, and kind of all the other kind of leading retailers so they can get it there. I'm at Eric PB dot me. Um, so E R I C P B dot M E. And I've got, you know, kind of the, the Twitter and Facebook and Instagram handles off that as well. And I'm always, uh, I'm always open to hearing different lenses and perspectives from the book. Cause it's, it's so cool how the takeaways are so different, you know, depending on kind of people's upbringing and their mindset and stuff. So for sure. All right, everybody, the links will be all in the description. Again, the name of the book is surfing rogue waves. Eric, thank you so much for coming on, man. I really, really enjoyed it. And, uh, thanks again, man. Till next time. Thanks so much for having me. That was